Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hamas, like all resistance groups, from the African National Congress to the Irish Republican Army, is demonized and misunderstood. Hamas is not, despite what Israel and Washington say, a terrorist organization. Although, like most resistance groups, including the Jewish militias that created the state of Israel, it has used terrorism as a tactic. Hamas is a religious, nationalist, political movement. It does not hold the Palestinians in Gaza hostage. It has broad popular support among Palestinians, largely because of the failure of the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, to deliver the promises made by Israel in the Oslo Accords. But it also has popular support because of its dogged resistance to the Israeli attack on Gaza. Indeed, since the Israeli attacks, it has become lionized throughout the Muslim world. The ferocity of the Israeli violence against Hamas, including the routine assassination and imprisonment of its leadership, has failed to dismantle the organization. To outsiders, the intransigence of Hamas, which in its 1988 charter called for Israel's destruction and which carried out suicide bombings in Israeli cities as well as firing rockets into Israel, uh, and along with the incursion, of course, that left some 1,200 Israelis dead, is dismissed by Israel and Washington as evidence of the group's fanaticism. Because those on the outside do not understand what went into making Hamas, the steady drip of humiliation, violence, and impoverishment that define Israel's occupation of the Palestinians, Hamas and its ideology is certified as incomprehensible. But from the Palestinian perspective, Israel has left the Palestinians with no other choice. The secular Palestinian Authority, which nominally governs the occupied West Bank, has devolved into little more than a hated colonial police force. It has failed to blunt Israel's slow motion ethnic cleansing. Israel has steadily dispossessed more and more Palestinians from their homes and land in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, seizing water resources. It uses indiscriminate violence to quell dissent. In short, by shutting the door to any peaceful resolution to the conflict, Israel created its own nemesis, the mirror image of an intransigent and brutal apartheid state. Joining me to discuss the Palestinian resistance group Hamas is journalist and historian Paolo Caridi, author of Hamas, From Resistance to Regime. Let's talk about the origins of Hamas. It comes out of the Muslim Brotherhood. You should explain what the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, and a little historical perspective because uh, until uh, 1967, uh, Gaza in particular, and Hamas is a a Gaza-based organization, uh, was uh, controlled by Egypt. Uh, Hamas is the political branch of the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. And so I put two terms in, in, in our discussion, Hamas and the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. The Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood, as the Muslim Brotherhood movements in the region, was and is a social religious um, organization, uh, very deeply um, inside the refugee camps in, uh, in Gaza. And uh, it is for a reason, because uh, uh, Gaza was, I have to say was and not is, um, home to um, hundreds of thousands of uh, Palestinians kicked out of their houses in Jaffa, in Majdal, in Ashkelon. And uh, they had to create again a world their world, their community, 
the Muslim Brotherhood was one of the organizations that spread inside the refugee camps in Gaza, but not only in Gaza. It's true, Gaza is the stronghold of Hamas, but Hamas and the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood is not only inside Gaza and is not only inside the West Bank. It's uh, among uh, the Palestinians abroad, out of Israel and Palestine. Um, Hamas uh, uh, was born out of the, uh, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood um, after a long discussion as the political branch of a socio-religious uh, um, association, organization. And uh, as the many of the leaders and the activists said to me, and not only the Muslim brothers, not all the Muslim brothers were Hamas, but all the Hamas people is, is uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood. And that it, and this is saying many things also about the Islamist movement and the uh, the fact that the Hamas uh, movement was and is, as you said, a very nationalist one. So in the book, you talk about the, the way uh, future leaders of Hamas were educated, uh, acculturated by Egypt. Uh, I knew Abdul Aziz Rantisi, uh, one of the co-founders of Hamas, as well as his wife, who, and I know you interviewed her, uh, a very impressive woman in her own right, who was assassinated by the Israelis uh, in, during this, at the very inception of this uh, assault on uh, Gaza. Uh, Rantisi studied at the university in Alexandria. I think he was first in his class. Um, uh, and, uh, and let's just talk a little bit quickly about what the Muslim Brotherhood was with the rise of Nasser, the secular uh, kind of pan-Arabist movement, the Muslim Brotherhood became a target. Um, and uh, but they, they the, just tell us a little bit quickly about the origins of the Muslim Brotherhood, what its perspective was, and then uh, I want to go into the birth of Hamas, which is tied directly to the first Palestinian uprising or Intifada. Yes, the Muslim Brotherhood definitely uh, was born inside Egypt uh, almost uh, one century ago. So it's not uh, uh, um, a movement that uh, was born uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, 40 years ago, but uh, it has a century of uh, um, also of changes, not only of history, but of changes as as an historic, as a as a as a, a socio-religious, and in the case of Egypt, a political one. Um, it is a uh, inside the so-called reformist Islamist movement. So it's very different from G the jihadi ones and from the Salafi ones. Very pragmatic, very inside the reality, uh, very deep inside the society. So it's not uh, um, an hyper-fundamentalist as the Salafi uh, movements are, as the jihadis are, and uh, especially at a certain point of its history, the Muslim Brotherhood decided not to use any more uh, violent tools, but to be inside, let's say, uh, pacifist way of uh, dealing with politics and uh, social issues inside the Egyptian arena. The same thing, almost the same thing is in the Tunisian, um, in the Tunisian context. Uh, it's, it is different in, uh, uh, in Palestine because of the occupation. It's not a country uh, an independent country is a, a territory under occupation. So the reaction inside the Muslim Brotherhood, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood, was to create a political arm, a political, political branch that uh, would use 
along the years, also terrorist means. So let's talk about the birth of Hamas, uh, which uh, was a very, I think, pragmatic, politically pragmatic response to the Palestinian uprising. Yes, it it was a very pragmatic response uh, in the first intifada. So the the birth of Hamas is in December 1987. So it, it, specifically the beginning of the intifada, the first intifada. But I have to say that we have to start a little bit before, in 1982, when the PLO was uh, in, his, in, the, in, in crisis, uh, and the crisis was in Beirut, not in Israel-Palestine, but was in Beirut. When the, uh, the PLO had to leave Beirut and to go into another exile, let me just interrupt you for people who don't know. The Israelis occupied Beirut, uh, rather savagely bombed whole sections of Beirut, uh, and there was a deal cut that the Palestinians would be put on ships and sent into exile uh, to Tunis. That's, I used to interview Arafat in Tunis, along with Abu Jihad and others. Uh, so uh, that's the crisis you're referring to. Yes, and the reaction of the Islamist niveau, so the the Muslim brothers and Hamas was, uh, uh, let's say, it was not born in those days, but they were debating about a political branch. Hamas was also a reaction on the kind of politics that the PLO uh, followed along the years. So they decided, for example, not to be involved inside the internal matters of the countries that hosted them. Uh, and it's very clear, for example, in Damascus, uh, when the leadership of Hamas was in Damascus, they didn't care about the destiny of the Muslim, the Syrian Muslim brothers, because they wanted to be hosted by uh, but they didn't want to deal with internal matters, as the PLO did both in Jordan and after that in the Lebanese civil war. So this was, the, for example, one of the decisions of the, um, of the Islamists. And after, that means of Hamas, and after 1987, the birth of Hamas, uh, the decision of the PLO to recognize the state of Israel, the Hamas opposed this idea and was the opposition inside the uh, poly Palestinian political spectrum. Let's talk about why they opposed it. And they turned out to be right, of course. Uh, so Arafat and the PLO are allowed to return. Um, but as Hamas predicted, uh, the Palestinians were betrayed. So explain the opposition of Hamas, their opposition, and what happened after the Oslo agreement was signed and the PLO leadership returned to Gaza and the West Bank. But one of the reasons uh, is inside the, the Mithak, the fundamental, uh, the, the the foundational charter of Hamas, the destruction of Israel, or to say that the Palestine is not in the hands of the people, but it's in the hands of God. And this is the Islamist part of, uh, of Hamas. And then there is also a national, nationalistic issue. What about uh, the land of Palestine? What about recognizing Palestinians? And... Uh, I think that this goes deep inside the refugees case um, because uh, um, um, Arafat, who was a refugee himself, put aside the, the question of the refugees. And the, it's not the case for Hamas. Hamas was born inside the refugee camps. Hamas is inside not only the refugee camps and the OPT, the Occupied Palestine Territory, but it's outside. And this was not uh, one of the focal points, the core issues inside the agreement between uh, the PLO 
and Israel. Right. This is called the right of return. And as you point out in the book, because a disproportionate number of the people in Gaza are refugees or descended from refugees, and because Hamas, Hamas's base is uh, probably found most predominantly in Gaza, although it's very popular, of course, in the West Bank, especially after uh, the, uh, Israel embarked on its uh, genocide. Um, uh, but that was non-negotiable. It wasn't the way the PLO, as you pointed out, could sidestep the issue. That wasn't something that Hamas was able to do, given its its base of support. Yes, and uh, we see today uh, regarding the UNRWA, uh, UNRWA, uh, the attack against UNRWA is also the attack uh, against the question, the Palestinian question in itself, as the UNRWA owns the registry of the refugees and the descendants of the refugees. So it's a really a core issue in the Palestinian question that we put, we, I say as analysts, journalists also, we put aside for a long time and uh, came up again in, this, in these weeks and months. And I just, for UNRWA is the UN organization that provides assistance to Palestinians, not just food, but schools, uh, uh, and uh, uh, both uh, in places like Gaza and in the diaspora. Israel accused uh, the UN organization of UNRWA of being infiltrated by Hamas, and this saw many countries, including the United States, the UK, and others, cut off their support of UNRWA, which is, of course, only accelerating the starvation and the famine within Gaza. And that, of course, has been accompanied by the blockage of uh, humanitarian assistance, all backed up in, in the Sinai in Egypt at the border, the border crossing at Rafa. Yes, and always not only, as you said, in Gaza, it, uh, uh, it helps uh, almost 6 million people. Let's talk about, so Hamas, um, uh, is born uh, as a distinct organization with the first intifada. It's in opposition to the PLO. Just talk quickly about the uh, collapse of credibility of the PLO as Israel does not uh, follow through on the promises made in the Oslo Agreement to create a separate uh, state and then uh, I want to talk about the elections that brings brought Hamas to power. Uh, you know, Hamas also represented the people inside the Palestinian occupied territory, and PLO was in exile. The first intifada was an intifada from the internal um, the internal camp, not from the exile. And then, in a way, the PLO in exile jumped on the Intifada, and then the Oslo process started its its path. Uh, Hamas represented the uh, part of the internal camp, um, and this is, I think, a differentiation that we have to underline. Um, there was uh, the, the the confrontation between Hamas and the PLO, especially Fatah and Harafat, was very very strong, very deep. It, it went very deep inside the, the history of the Palestinian uh, politics and resistance for along the years. Um, in those years, uh, um, Hamas decided also to use terrorism. And it started from 1994 after the Hebron massacre done by a settler, Baruch Gosh. Let's let's stop. Let's stop there because that Hebron massacre, which I covered for the New York Times, was a turning point. So let's explain what happened and why it was a turning point before we go on. Uh, Baruch Goldstein was a settler from uh, a settlement. Uh, Beside, close to to Hebron, Khalil for the Palestinians, and uh, uh, he killed uh, almost 30, 30 people inside the mosque. Inside the mosque, the Ebrahimi mosque is the 
the second mosque, the most important mosque in Palestine. And, uh, and then he was killed by the faithful people. They were praying during the Ramadan. Uh, after 40 days, and it was a sh- not only it was a shock, but until today, for the the city of Khalil, Hebron, uh, that moment still is in the memory, still is in the tragic memory of the community. Um, after 40 days, uh, the the period of mourning for the uh, for the not only for the Palestinian for the Muslim people. Uh, last 40 days, after 40 days, there was the first suicide attack in Hadera, inside Israel, done by uh, um, an, uh, an activist from a terrorist from the Qassam Brigade, the, mili- the armed wing of, the, of Hamas. And uh, uh, I will differentiate between the armed wing in that moment and the military wing right now in this in these days and months. Um, it, it was the beginning of a tragic era of suicide attack, attacks inside the, the buses, inside the coffee shops against civilians inside Israel, but not only the Qassam brigades, so the armed wing of Hamas, did suicide attacks. And I think it has to be underlined. Uh, it finished it, um, in 2005 when Hamas and the jihad, the Islamic jihad, and all the Palestinian factions uh, signed an agreement in Cairo in March 2005, suspending the suicide attacks and the terrorist attacks and uh, paving the way to the elections, to the political elections of 2006, but also to the presidential elections of Abu Mazen as the new president of the Palestinian Authority. So these elections are, are important because they're heavily monitored by the international community. Uh, Hamas runs its slate of candidates. Uh, It's certified as a free and fair election. This is 2006. And then what happens? Uh, If I may add, not only it was heavily monitored by the international community, it was supported by the international community. And even Israel uh, gave the permit to the Palestinians in Jerusalem to vote for those elections. And nobody asked Hamas to recognize Israel before participating to the elections. I think this is the important point because in a way, in an ambiguous way, Hamas recognized the Palestinian Authority in participating to the elections for the parliament of the Palestinian Authority. And this was a big change inside Hamas, voted by the majority of the activists and the the people of Hamas, um, internally voted. After that, the problem was that Hamas won the elections because uh, probably the international community and even Israel thought that, and even Hamas, thought that uh, it could gain um, many votes to be an, a stronger opposition inside the parliament. But nobody of the actors, and also Hamas, expected for Hamas to win the, the elections, and it was a big success. This changed also the attitude, not only of Hamas, but of Fatah, and of the international community. It means that the international community and Israel decided an embargo, a factual embargo against the government run by Hamas. And uh, after a few months, there was a split inside the political arena, the Palestinian political arena, and Hamas did a coup in, uh, in Gaza in June 2007. Fatah and the PA 
controlled, we know that they didn't control that much the West Bank. And uh, after that, Israel decided to uh, seal the Gaza Strip and detach the Gaza Strip from the Palestinian occupied territory. This, uh, I think that the split of the unity uh, of the territory is really the core issue nowadays. Because uh, since the beginning, since 2007, this uh, division between West Bank and Gaza was the death of an idea of a state of Palestine. And this was supported by Bibi Netanyahu, who saw this split as furthering his own aims uh, to prevent a Palestinian state. Indeed, I remember I was there uh, in Gaza when Hamas uh, first emerged. And uh, while it's probably not correct to say that in any way, I think as you point out in your book, that Hamas is a creation of Israel, as some have charged, uh, but the, they would uh, carry out there, or the Israelis who were still inside Gaza at the time, would carry out far harsher forms of repression against Fatah or the PLO than they would uh, carry out in the beginning against the Hamas figures uh, because uh, they uh, mistakenly saw these divisions within the Palestinian leadership as advantageous. Can you talk about that? Yes, it's uh, it's true. Uh, many uh, are saying these months that uh, Hamas was a creation of Israel. It's uh, I, I think it's uh, it's not right. Both for both parties, for Israel and for Hamas. Hamas is deep inside the uh, the Palestinian society, uh, and uh, and Israel. Uh, was very repressive against Hamas, especially after 1989 and 19, even 1988, 1989, 1992, 1994, there was where there were uh, waves of repression of not only of leaders but of activists of Hamas. And then it started the era or the tragic era of the um uh, assassinations, uh, the extrajudicial killings of the leaders of Hamas, uh, the result was not the result uh, uh, Israel expected. If you think about the 2000, uh, 2004, it was a very important uh, year. Um, Israel killed uh, Sheikh Yassin, uh, um, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, in March 2004. A month later, Abdelaziz Arantisi. Um, the, these were the co. This, these were the co-founders. The co-founders, yes. And after one year and a half, Hamas won the elections. I mean, the extrajudicial killings. They didn't have the result to cut the head of the snake, and therefore kill the snake. Um, what Netanyahu did in the more, most recent year, years was to really detach completely Gaza from the West Bank, and in this way um, try to cross to over to overcross uh, the, um, the Palestinians as protagonists of a negotiation. Gaza was uh, an open air prison, is an open air prison. West Bank was the PA was very weak inside the West Bank. So what was the solution, according to Netanyahu, to call the some Arab states? to normalize the situation in the region without the Palestinians. So no Palestinian at the negotiating table. This is not the way to uh, reach a viable solution, to reach a viable peace, uh, peace in respect and dignity. And the result that we see, we see now. And we should be clear that Egypt overthrew, Sisi overthrew, a Muslim Brotherhood government. There's been terrible repression uh, against the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. 
uh, the, he has uh, he, the Egyptian government has a deep hostility, not only to the Muslim Brotherhood but to Hamas, as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, and has been uh, working uh, quite closely with Israel. Uh, it's in at, as we as we speak, it's building an alternative open air prison uh, for what we assume will be Palestinians pushed out of. Uh, Gaza, uh, but we should talk a little bit about the the regional response uh, to the rise of Hamas within the Arab world, and then, of course, I want to talk about October seventh and what has happened since. The reaction in the, in the Arab region was different according to the period we, we I mean, the periods we are talking about. Um, Hamas, the leadership of Hamas. Uh, uh, moved itself from one place to another according to the support it received. So from Jordan, actually the beginning from the Kuwait to Jordan to the to Syria and after the uh, the Arab revolutions and the counter revolutions to Turkey to Qatar. Uh, in uh, in uh, after the Egyptian revolution for a period, also to Egypt, Musa Boumarzouk, one of the leaders of Hamas, uh, moved, for example, to Cairo uh, for a period of time. But uh, it was a short period because of the coup of Abdel, uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in, uh, in Cairo and the um, annihilation of the of the Egyptian revolution of the Thawra. Um the Arab region has different uh, uh, relations with Hamas uh, in a way pragmatic in a way uh, very strongly opposed to Hamas but it depends really on which period we, which period of time we are talking about of course Egypt the patron, the mediator, the mediator in all the, the, the issues regarding the Palestinian arena is pro Fatah and against Hamas, but it's also a pragmatic actor. And we see nowadays how pragmatic it is, for example, on the negotiation on the ceasefire and the release of the hostages and the, uh, uh, for the Palestinian prisoners in ta- inside the Israeli jails, but also regarding the reconciliation um, uh, between Fatah and Hamas uh, that la- is lasting. I mean, it's a process like the, all the processes in the Middle East is, is, is lasting years and years and years without a result. Let's talk about October 7th. How did you read what happened on October 7th? Ah, this is a very tough and difficult question. It's my headache, as I suppose is the headache of many among us. I think that uh, it, uh, it underlines a division or, a, uh, yes, a division inside Hamas between Hamas inside Gaza and Hamas outside Gaza. The balance of power inside Hamas uh, um moved um changed a lot in these years when gaza was an open air prison administered and controlled by hamas and when i say hamas i say especially the part of hamas inside gaza many of the leaders for example moved from gaza uh, to uh, safe havens abroad, and uh, the the figure, the personality of Yaya Sinwar, uh, was gaining power uh, um, along the years uh, since his release in 2011. Let me just I, stop you there, because as you delineate in the book, you have a fascinating dissection of how uh, the power structure within Hamas, including its decentralization. Of authority, which is why Israel's not been able to decapitate it. But uh, there's also a stark division between the political branch and the internal security branch. So before you go on, just explain how that works. 
uh, Hamas is a political movement uh, with a, a very strong structure, but a decentralized one in, fa- in four constituencies. And the four constituency are, uh, constituencies are very um, uh, strange uh, uh, seeing from a, an, a European or a Western perspective. So they are the territory, so there is the constituency of Hamas in Gaza, in the West Bank, abroad, it means the refugee camps, it means the diaspora, but there is also constituency inside the prison. When we think about prisons, we don't think uh, about uh, a political activity inside the prison, but in the case of the Palestinian prisoners, they continue to be political actors inside the prison, and this was the case of Hamas. What I uh, assume, what I what I think in my book is that uh, along the years, and especially in the most recent years, there, there is another shadow constituency, that means uh, the military one. I say the military one because there, there was and there is an armed wing of Hamas, the Qassam brigades, and since the beginning, there was a, 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 an armed wing. From 2007 on until now, that means from the moment in which Hamas started to be the power inside Gaza, the power, the administration, uh, and also the, the armed force, the Gassam Brigade, I assume they became, became the military wing. There was a militarization of the armed wing. And that this means that uh, it gained also a political influence, a very strong political influence also in defining the political structure. So that means uh, who will win in the internal elections of Hamas. And that was the case in the last uh, internal elections. And uh, the figure of Hamas, of uh, Yahya Sinwar, emerging as the leader of of Hamas, not of all Hamas, but at least of Hamas in Gaza. It meant also not a split, but a distance between Hamas in Gaza and the leadership abroad, or the leaderships abroad, because probably there are different sensibilities uh, among the leadership, the leaderships abroad, not only in Doha, there is a leadership also in Beirut. Okay, let's talk about October 7th and your take on what happened. It happened that uh, as far as uh, as uh, we know through the, 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 what the re- reports, uh, uh, the journalistic reports, Only few people in Gaza decided the October 7 attack inside Israel, uh, done by the Qassam brigades and Al-Quds brigades linked to the the Islamic Jihad. And uh, a lot of people went out of the fence in October 7. What was the, the, I mean, the goal of October 7 It was very clear in the document that after some months, um, Hamas uh, uh, published, uh, some months after October 7. That means uh, um, they wanted to take hostages to do an exchange with the Palestinian prisoners inside the um, Israeli prisons. Thousands of Palestinians are inside the Israeli prisons. Including not, uh, including women and children. Including women and children administrative, in administrative detention. And many of them, they are not uh, part of the Palestinian factions even. Um, so this was one of the goals of Yahya Sinwar, who spent a lot of years inside the Israeli prisons. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a core issue also on October, in October 7 because of what is happening on the Haram al-Sharif, that means on the mosques and Esplanade, 
or a temple mount for the Jews. And uh, because of what the new, um, but not only the new, but especially the new Israeli government is doing in the last uh, e in the last years, in the last year, but also in the last years, um, uh, Hamas uh, also in 2021 was clear on the fact that Jerusalem is the core issue of the Palestinian question. And uh, he wants also, he wanted also in 2021 to cross the fence of the open air prison of Gaza using Jerusalem as a tool to uh, and let the people understand that they were not in Gaza, they were out of Gaza, they were dealing with the entire, the whole Palestinian question. So this was really another of the reasons of uh, of October 7. The third one is the West Bank. So they wanted to say we are not confined in Gaza. We are part of the Palestinian political spectrum and we want to cross and open the fence and open the open air prison and let the people, our public, our consensus understand that, that we are still there. I want to talk about Jerusalem because I thought it was one of the most insightful parts of your book as being central to the identity of Palestinians and the resistance movement. Can you explain why? Because Jerusalem is not only a religious symbol. Jerusalem is more than this. It's a national symbol. It's a national icon. And not only for Hamas, not only for the Palestinians or of the occupied Palestinian, ter Palestine ter Palestinian territory, but also for the Palestinians inside Israel. The Palestinians inside Israel are 2 million, 20% of the Israeli population. Uh, they see, as the other Palestinians see also inside the diaspora outside Israel, Palestine, Jerusalem as the myth, as the uh, their identity, which is not really a religious one. We forget, for example, that there is there are the the Palestinians uh, with a, a a Christian faith. And those Palestinians are nationalistic as the as are the others as are the Palestinian Muslims. Jerusalem is is that part of their identity that means all together in a place like the old city. So uh, thinking uh, to uh, possess Jerusalem from the Israeli side is really uh, breaking breaking the last the last uh, wall for the Palestinians they will not renounce to Jerusalem and it was very clear in 2021 when a peaceful protest was going on in different parts of Jerusalem that means uh, in the old city on the Haram al Sharif al Aqsa in front of Damascus Gate, the core, the secular, the secular central part of, uh, of the Arab sentiment, of the Palestinian sentiment, and uh, in Sheikh Jarrah, for the people who know Jerusalem, very near the American colony, because there, there was the, the, the issue of the settlers who wanted to really uh, take possess of uh, the most important parts of the city in order for, for the city to be completely conquered, not only by the Israelis, but by the Messianic settlement movement. Well, they've changed the geography of Jerusalem. It doesn't even physically look like the city that I first visited in 1988 because of the Jewish settlers and the, the buildings they've erected and the evictions they've carried out. Uh, let's close by talk about, talking about what's happening now in Gaza. Uh, the Netanyahu government says this is a war against Hamas. They claim that uh, victory will be defined by the eradication 
of Hamas, uh, what, what's happening in Gaza, what's happening to Hamas, uh, and, and what does this portend for the future? But what I see is not the cancellation of Hamas. I, what I see is the complete cancellation of Gaza, which is a, a complete different uh, uh, picture, portrayal, what is happening in Gaza. The strategy, I think that the Israeli strategy changed along the weeks and then the months of this war on Gaza. And uh, at a certain point, it started to be the, uh, a war uh, with a, a very specific goal, the expulsion of the Palestinians from Gaza. And after that, we have to take care of the second front of this war, which is the West Bank and what is going on re in the West Bank in these months. And it's not, and it's a tragic picture of, uh, of, of, of what is happening there. Um, the expulsion of the Palestinian, what does it mean? It means a second Nakba. It means also the end of the idea of the two states, although the two states, we know they, were, they died many, many years ago as a perspective. And uh, it is also the idea to finish the chapter of 1948. It's 1948, the core issue. So they, uh, I think the Israeli government wants to, um, uh, to arrive to this goal that means uh, to finish the, the, uh, the expulsion of the Palestinians from Palestine. And the consequences? And what does it mean for Hamas? You know, Hamas is not only in Gaza. So I think that uh, saying that, that the Israeli narrative, saying uh, we will get rid of Hamas, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not in the reality on the ground as Hamas, as we see, as we see is not only in Gaza, is not only in Doha, is not only in Beirut, is a movement that is deep inside the Palestinian society. And we see also in the videos coming from the West Bank and that people is asking from the Ghassan brigades to come and liberate the West Bank. It will not happen, of course, but we have to see the reality. And the reality is not that in this way, Israel is uh, cutting the, the grass under Hamas, and, but in a way, outside of Gaza, because I don't think that the consensus uh, on Hamas is uh, growing in Gaza, is uh, lesser in Gaza and more in the West Bank. But uh, we see that, it's, uh, it's, uh, that Hamas is gaining ground outside Gaza. So what about the, the goal? The, does Netanyahu reach the goal in, the, in this way? I think that is the opposite is uh, is going on and that uh, the reaction not only of the palestinians but uh, of the arab street will be even more and more anti israel anti israeli sentiment and, and you're traumatizing a whole new generation i remember speaking to uh rantisi and he told me the story of being a 9 year old boy in han yunis in 1956 when the Israelis occupied and watching the Israeli forces line uh, men and boys up against a wall, including his uncle, and killing them. And that moment uh, was a moment that radicalized him uh, because to him it exposed the intent of the Israelis, which was the extermination of the Palestinian people. How is this going to play out uh, in the years ahead? Uh, I don't know, because I, what I see from from Jordan is that uh, nobody is saying anything, but you see in the in the face of the people that it's difficult to 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 have this weight on their heart and their shoulders to see what they see and probably in the u s and in my Europe, in my Italy, 
the people don't see the images from Gaza. The images from Gaza are unbearable to each of us, and especially to the Arab street. They are really unbearable. I can't uh, uh, bear the images of children who are dying for starvation. I can't bear the images of women who, who have not uh, who have problems with their their menstrual. Uh, cycle that they don't have uh, sanitary pads that they don't have anything bread flour etc it's unbearable simply unbearable and it's not a humanitarian issue because a humanitarian issue means to cover the fact that this is a political issue for all of us not only for the arab region great thank you that was journalist and historian paula karidi author of hamas from resistance to regime I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.